welcome back to the DASH webinar series. My name is Megan Diamond and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Innovation at the Harvard Global Health Institute. I'm excited to welcome you here today to our webinar entitled Mature Tech Solutions in the COVID-19 Response, Leveraging What Already Works to Improve Health Outcomes. This webinar is the fourth in a series co-hosted by the Novartis Foundation and MIT Critical Data, which is bringing together experts from around the world to explore the role of tech and AI in the response to COVID-19, with a specific focus on low resource settings or those with high socioeconomic disparity. For those of you who were able to join us last week, you heard that our conversation was really focusing on new solutions that had been kickstarted in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's webinar is in many ways a really nice complement to that conversation, where instead of exploring brand new technologies that have emerged, panelists will discuss how they are repurposing or expanding existing digital solutions to fight COVID-19. We'll hear about specific tools that are being used in low resource settings, explore the value of using mature technologies, and discuss how these existing tools can complement the new ones, similar to those that we heard about last week. So let me introduce you to our speakers today. Shabnam Agarwal is an innovator of tech solutions for low-income consumers, a social enterprise startup advisor, and a published author covering topics such as entrepreneurship, failure, and startups. Her role at Demagi is akin to one of an entrepreneur in residence. Leading the new business division, Shabnam and her team test new product ideas in international development, international development market to determine if and how they can support Demagi's clients and mission to create greater impact while enabling Demagi to become a self-sustaining organization. Shabnam's career has spanned the education and healthcare technology industries across Cambodia, India, and now, based out of Rwanda, she focuses on East Africa. Dr. Koku Awinor Williams is a public health physician consultant and currently director responsible for planning, policy, monitoring, and evaluation of the Ghana Health Service. He has almost three decades of experience in senior health management positions in Ghana, including 16 years as the district medical officer and eight years as regional director of health services. Prior to that, he had been the national coordinator of Ghana's flagship primary health care program, the Community-Based Health Planning and Services Initiative. His interests include health policy, health system development for marginalized population, and marginalized populations, and implementation science for evidence-based decision-making. Dr. Karin Callender is a senior health specialist in the Implementation, Research, and Delivery Science Unit in the Health Section at UNICEF. She's the unit focal point for child and community health and the global lead for digital health. She previously worked as a senior research advisor at the Malaria Consortium in London, where she was heading the organization's research group. She's a specialist in pneumonia and health systems research, as well as community-based primary health care. She's an associate professor at the Department of Global Health at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Dr. Callender has over 18 years of experience as a researcher, lecturer, program coordinator, and consultant in both development and emergency settings. And lastly, our discussion today will be moderated by Adele Wagaman. She is the Senior Digital Health Advisor at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Over the past decade, she has led programs and engagement campaigns at the intersection of digital technologies and global development, including as founder and managing director of an independent consulting practice and previously as head of a $30 million partnership with the United Nations Foundation and the Vodafone Foundation. Her experience includes work as a journalist, editor, and communications advisor to both humanitarian groups and technology companies. She's an affiliated expert at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and a member of several advisory bodies for companies and nonprofits advancing strategic digital innovation in the health and humanitarian sectors. So before we get started, just a couple housekeeping notes. We're going to be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. So we have enabled an ask a question feature on the bottom of your screen 
throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, you can just pop them in there. I'll be reviewing them and we will do our best to answer them. As a reminder, this video is being live streamed here through Zoom and it's also being live streamed through Facebook. A recording will be made available on our website, which is dashinafrica.org, around 24 hours after this panel is over. And lastly, on Tuesday, June 20, rather June 16th at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will have our fifth webinar co-hosted with AI for Good, an initiative out of the UN's International Telecommunications Unit, Union entitled Can Image-Based AI Meaningfully Impact COVID-19 Response in Low Resource Settings? For more information on this webinar and others, please visit us at dashinafrica.org. Registration for that webinar will open on Thursday. With that, um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Adele, who will be leading the discussion today. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about a topic that I know is front and center of many people's minds uh, today as COVID-19 impacts um, just about every community around the world. Um, and it's nice to follow on the conversation about the new innovations that have been kickstarted uh, as part of the global COVID-19 response and to follow that with a discussion of how we can also be looking at where there are existing, mature, established digital technologies that also can play a really fundamental role to thinking about how best we prepare ourselves, respond, and seek to strengthen our health systems um, and health outcomes um, to be more resilient in the face of future disease outbreaks. So we know that to meet the challenge posed by COVID-19, we have to harness the power of innovation, but it's equally critical to leverage what already works. And these two things don't need to be in conflict. One important aspect of innovation is innovating on the edges of established and mature digital technologies. Uh, and this is a critical way to scale, particularly in the context of a fast moving disease outbreak like coronavirus. Uh, speaking um, as someone working with USAID, USAID has a longstanding commitment to investing in transformative innovations, including those that um, rely on or are based on digital technologies. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the USAID Grand Challenge funding rounds. Uh, this is one way in which USAID has funded a number of these tools. Uh, and I'll give just a few examples of how USAID has funded these innovations in the past and how those same innovations are now being used successfully today to support the COVID-19 response. So one is a Kenya-based nonprofit called Jacaranda Health. Uh, they have digital health tools for pregnant women and new mothers that now include a COVID-19 chatbot. Another is Damagi's Comcare, and Shabnam will be telling us more about uh, Damagi in just a moment. But USAID is one example, funded Damagi's Comcare contact tracing app during the West Africa Ebola outbreak uh, to understand better and in a more timely way where the cases were and where we need to be positioning our response. Um, and of course, ComCare is being used widely today, including to support the COVID-19 response across a range of different use cases. I know Shabnam will talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, another example is Mhero. Mhero is a software system that um, stitched together a number of existing software tools in West Africa during the Ebola outbreak response that for the first time enabled direct two-way messaging between frontline health workers and the Ministry of Health. And this was very powerful in the context of a disease outbreak where you needed eyes and ears in the field to know where the disease was spreading and you needed to have that rapid communication back and forth. So these are just a few examples um, of the many digital systems and mobile phone based tools that are being adapted from the context of routine health service delivery to be used for the COVID-19 response. Uh, and I think overall this, this tracks with a trend around the world in which we see increasingly health systems are digitizing um, and that this can be critical for getting data and information faster uh, and more reliably. And it also, also offers the critical advantage of being able to create feedback loops. So with the example of connecting frontline health workers with the Ministry of Health for the first time, um, you were able to introduce a real-time communications environment that was both important for planners in the Ministry of Health, but also for situational awareness for uh, frontline health workers that were working at the facility or clinic um, district community levels. 
Um, and it can also expand the reach of care, such as through telemedicine. And of course, no matter where you are in the world, uh, everyone is seeing an uptick in the use of telemedicine as the pandemic uh, makes it important for people to stay as socially distanced as possible. Uh, and so with this digital transformation comes a variety of opportunities to strengthen health systems. Uh, I had the opportunity in 2016 to work with Dr. Larissa Fest, um, the co-author with me of a report called Fighting Ebola with Information, where we looked at how data and information and digital technologies were used as part of the Ebola outbreak response in West Africa. And there are a number of recommendations in that report uh, that draw on insights and lessons from across the global response to Ebola, looking at um, both the health and humanitarian sides about what we can be doing differently to leverage those insights to be better positioned to respond more effectively to a disease outbreak of the scale of Ebola. And now, of course, it's COVID that we're talking about. And many of those insights are directly transferable and directly applicable. Um, and just a couple of those that I'll highlight here because I think they'll help enrich our discussion is that digital technologies to be um, used effectively require a lot of strategic planning um, and that we need to understand the use environment um, and make sure that our use of the digital technologies aligns to the capacities of the use environment. And that can include from understanding the quality and reach of digital infrastructure in a country to um, the capacity of the workforce um, and making sure that when we are making as funders, for example, investments in these tools, we're investing not just in the technology, but also in the use environment so that these tools can be used as intended. Um, another is to plan for interoperability between digital systems. This is really critical where from a planning perspective, you need to have insights from different sources of digital data um, and you need to be able to compare and leverage that data in a way that enables the data to be meaningfully used to understand how an outbreak is spreading and to be able to effectively and appropriately plan an operational response. Um, and, and that requires interoperability in many cases. And interoperability is also critical for the ongoing um, strengthening of health systems and the resilience of health systems in the face of uh, future diseases. Uh, we also know we need to pay careful attention to standards and terminology. Uh, so a lot of detailed work and a lot of work around um, strengthening the use environment for these tools. And for me, to me, that all speaks to the importance of looking at where we do have existing tools, where we already have strong use environments in place, the technologies are already being used to collect data sets, um, and those data sets are being already being used for um, health system strengthening, or these uh, technologies are already being used for health service delivery. Uh, and so looking at how best we can leverage these mature digital health solutions are critical, again, in the context of a fast moving disease like COVID, uh, but also for ongoing health system strengthening. And so I'm looking forward to this discussion to talk about where we do have these tools, how they're being used, um, and where we do still have gap areas where either we need new innovations in product or in process um, to complement these tools or to help these tools um, be used more effectively. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that, looking at what we've learned from past experience and what's important to bear in mind today. And perhaps importantly for us all to walk away with a sense of um, how best we can be thinking about working together in the future to meet the continuing gap areas. So I'm pleased to now turn it over to the panelists who will each give brief opening remarks before we move into a discussion. Um, and we've already had an introduction of the panelists. Um, so I'll just go straight to questions. And um, Dr. Koku Awanor Williams uh, is, as Megan mentioned, uh, with the Ghana Health Service. And um, Koku, I would love to hear your perspective as a senior member of the government health office. How are digital systems, and in particular existing digital systems, uh, being used to support the COVID-19 response in Ghana? So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, I think I think that uh, you made a very important point that the use of existing digital solutions are very, very important in addressing or making sure that we we meet the changes that are provided by 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 the COVID. Um, in Ghana, I'm talking specifically for Ghana. We we have uh, deployed currently in tracking. COVID activities and COVID events across the country, a system which is referred to as SOMAX. 
But that is not to take away the fact that we also have existing systems that are, you know, collaborating and also, sub, you know, complementing the new system. And the idea is that eventually we'll be moving to the, the existing system so that we can have one, one stop shop solution. Uh, so um, in Ghana, for instance, we have what we call the DHS tool. And this tool is used as a country to collect all health data. Uh, including with notifiable diseases, it, you know, it, it track it track all kinds of events, uh, point of care, and all that. And uh, I'm thinking that you know, uh, since this system can be used, even what we refer to as influenza-like diseases, uh, you know, it can be a tool to to be used uh, in time. Then at the primary care level, we also have what we call the DHIS e-tracker. And this e-tracker is, is built to capture all notifiable diseases, including COVID-19. Uh, and, and, and in my view, and that's what we are working towards, that this will also be used to bridge the gap to support the current system that is being, that is what I refer to as the SUMAC system. Um, don't also forget that we also have a, a GIS model that supports community GIS coordinates with automatic data capture. And uh, this could easily be built upon also to support the current system being used. But let me also say that apart from that, there are some e-health solutions already in, in addition to the e-tracker, to the DHIS tool, that are also being used as complementary to data collection and reporting of events. We have the early warning system uh, this is deployed along the coastal regions of Ghana, and there are a lot of effort going on to deploy it to other regions. Then important also six regions, six out of the 16 renters that are used, you know, to data share information as part of capacity building, learning, and getting information across the, the districts. I already talked about the DIS2. Uh, which is the main system that cuts across all the districts, all the regions, all the sub-districts, all health facilities in Ghana report on that. Whatever discipline, whether it's TB, whether it's disease control, whether it's primary health care, whether it's and, you know, malaria, all health promotion activities are reported to the DHS2 system. Then the e-tracker mainly tracks, you know, maternal and child health facilities, you know, um, reports, in some of the regions, I talk about the TB care that is also being used to deploy and then collect data. One of the innovations that has been the latest has been very helpful in e-health solution was the deployment of uh, emergency drone delivery. Um, this is initially to advance out, you know, very deprived areas with essential medicines and logistics and vaccines. Now, with the outbreak and onset of COVID, this is now being used to collect samples from the hinterlands to deliver, you know, as part of, um, you know, getting quick results and quick reports to the laboratory centers in Accra and Kumasi. So these are the few solutions that we have deployed. I mean, the SOMAX is there, but then there are also existing e-health solutions that are also being used to complement the SOMAX system. And that is the, the case of the case of Ghana. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. But I had unmuted myself. Um, thank you, Coco. Really interesting to hear about the breadth of different digital solutions and tools um, from DHIS2, which is broadly scaled throughout the country, to uh, include now drone delivery. Um, um, and it's fascinating to, to hear about that um, as a tool that you were using already and um, is now being adapted for COVID-19. So um, we will come back for a further discussion on some of those points in a moment. Uh, but before we do so, Karen, Dr. Callender, and we'll turn it over to you. Um, so your perspective is interesting uh, as UNICEF is really a truly global organization. I think I saw it has a presence in uh, over 190 different countries around the mm -hmm. world um, and takes on a range of different needs related to um, humanitarian um, development assistance, 
for children. Um, and so given that breadth of tools um, that UNICEF already has had in play, when you think about COVID-19, what are the tools that uh, rise to the top of your mind as being the most important for thinking about how we can leverage what already works in responding to COVID-19? Thanks, Adele. Yes, um, um, in UNICEF, we, as you say, we work always with governments and supporting governments to deploy digital solutions where they can strengthen service delivery. And when the COVID uh, pandemic started, we um, at UNICEF were from the health response, there are three major areas that we are concerned about. One is uh, risk communication and community engagement. How can we leverage solutions, uh, digital platforms to communicate with the general population and public on, um, on information on the virus, how to protect themselves, how to combat rumors and misinformation, etc. The second area, <clears throat> which is a priority, is around frontline health workers and how to use solutions that can reach out to them, especially those who live on the most remote um, villages, uh, communities, where, you know, very low bandwidth settings, etc. How can we reach out to them, especially in situations where countries are in lockdown, to deliver training on COVID, how to not only recognize COVID patients, but also how to deliver normal health services in the time of, of coronavirus. The third area, which is a major priority is around monitoring of the secondary impact of the pandemic and its response on routine health services. We know from the Ebola epidemic that one of the uh, main problems was the increased number of children dying of malaria and other uh, communicable diseases as a result of health workers falling sick or not uh, being able to do uh, deliver the normal work. So those three areas um, is a prior there are priorities for us. And one of the things, um, we were able to do through existing channels, and I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. Um, sorry. Um, we have in 68 of the 192 or so countries where we work, we um, we have a program called You Report, um, which is a, a platform primarily to target young people, uh, adolescents with information, trusted information and safe space for young people to ask questions and, and, and it usually sits outside the government platforms. Your report already has over like many, many million subscribers, over 10 million people sub subscribing to this channel. It's a way to receive information uh, either on SMS, but it can also work on WhatsApp, uh, Facebook Messenger, Viber, etc. all those channels. We Already on February 13, very early on in the pandemic, we um, set up a Corona information chatbot on your report. And in three weeks time, we had gone from 150,000 users to over 2 million people subscribing to information on this platform. This U report, which we now call the UNICEF um, coronavirus information chatbot is now live in over 50 countries out of the 68 where the platform is live. And we continuously update the information according to the needs of what, what the users are asking, um, what users are seeking information on. So especially around uh, misinformation, myth busting, we can also do surveys and polls using this platform. In countries where you report isn't available, we also very early on in the pandemic developed together with WHO Euro, uh, something called Health Buddy, which is running on a web, uh, it's a web app um, available in a number of different languages, primarily designed for the Europe and Central Asia region where your report isn't typically available. Again, both these chatbots are powered by uh, an underlying mechanism called uh, Rapid Pro, being a two-way messaging function. Um, this later chatbot, the, which is called Health Buddy, is also uh, adding Rapid Pro together with um, uh, Botha to be able to have this artificial intelligent um, kind of um, addition to the chatbot, which has uh, natural language processing, users can type their questions, etc. And it's building the library that gets more um, clever as users are using it. And it's um, being deployed in a number of countries. At the same time as basically these two chatbots came out, WHO also created the, the WHO Health Alert, and which is also gaining millions and millions of users. So we believe these types of ways of interacting with users um, has been very effective 
Um, it gives us an opportunity to provide the latest evidence through these chatbots. It's also critical that the, up, that the information within these is up to date, is answering the user's needs. Otherwise, we can see very quickly how usage rate, rates go down. And we are now um, working with WHO uh, to ensure that the content behind these chatbots, uh, that we can align around that content, that we can help, these, uh, help each other make the content more relevant and up to date. Um, and just to end, um, we're also looking at these ways of communication being used for other use cases. Um, what we had developed as a health buddy for the general population, we're now thinking of as a health worker buddy, basically talking about taking the M Hero concept Adele was talking about and uh, adjusting and adapting that for COVID-19. Basically what that means is taking existing platforms, Rapid Pro, we have, again, uh, it's existing in over 68 countries. In many countries, we have zero rated SMS messaging through the system and through a collaboration or a partnership with Facebook, we also get free WhatsApp and uh, access to WhatsApp uh, and Facebook Messenger to add to these platforms. So basically what this health worker buddy concept means is we, we link this two-way messaging chatbot function to Iris or any kind of um, human health, health workforce register so that you can have a communication with your registered health work workforce in the country, um, whether it's community health workers or frontline health workers in facilities. And through this platform, so, uh, train health workers, deliver content and messaging and information, either whether it's SMS or face, you know, other digital media. Uh, we can have rich content for the, those users who have smartphones. And we can also use this platform for collecting data on some of the indicators that are important to monitor more frequently during the pandemic. It can be used to also uh, manage rumors and, and track rumors from the health workers perspective. We have uh, some countries using this to, to check in on anxiety, anxiety levels for health workers and the mental health, as well as um, things like reporting of uh, stockouts of essential uh, commodities or lab test results, etc. And also these, this system can um, already has a, a, a setup so that data can go straight into DHIS2. So those are sort of the platforms that at UNICEF that we have really been able to leverage during the first couple of months of the pandemic and that we try to scale uh, working with partners. Thank you. Great, thanks Karin. Um, I love how the innovation didn't stop with Health Buddy, that Health Buddy was stood up and worked really effectively very quickly and now you're looking at Health Worker Buddy as a way to continue um, building on what's working and adapting it to meet specific COVID-19 needs. Um, and I also like the nesting together of the more basic front-end SMS messaging capabilities with the back-end um, natural language processing, bringing together a full spectrum of different digital tools um, in a way that is intuitive to the user, but sophisticated um, and um, powerful. So we'll come back to that as well. Um, but last and not least, I wanna hand it over to Shabnam with Comcare. Um, Comcare is one of the most widely scaled global health software solutions in use today, um, with software in use in over 80 countries, I believe, uh, by more than 680,000 health workers last I checked. Um, and so huge global reach, a really powerful tool um, that is working well in many places. And so based on the scale of work you all are already doing, how do you see yourselves um, adapting to meet the specific requirements of COVID-19 um, and what guidance and um, insights do you have uh, as part of that process? Yeah, thanks Adele. Um, it's uh, really great to be here and to listen to all of these fascinating innovations that you guys have all come up with. Um, uh, at Demagi, of course, when COVID hit, uh, we started thinking through exactly like you said, how do we take the scale that we're at with the frontline workers around the world um, and start building innovative solutions that could support uh, the unique use cases and situations that were caused by COVID. So of course, overnight, uh, frontline work could not be done household to household anymore, um, and really did have to be converted into more, um, quote, online or uh, SMS messaging kind of work streams. Um, and, and so I think on one hand, the Magi said, okay, well, 
just using ComCare. And for anyone who's not aware, uh, ComCare is a data collection tool that can be used on Android devices. Um, and, and it's used uh, widely, as Adele mentioned. But um, what we wanted to see is, if a frontline worker didn't already have the ComCare application on their device, is there another way for them to still collect data from end users or cases or beneficiaries um, and, and enable governments and NGOs to still do data collection, uh, especially when it is in a remote scenario. So when you're not able to go household to household. Um, and of course, the first um, idea that came up for us as well was SMS. And when, actually when we saw what the WHO and turn.io was building um, from a chatbot perspective, um, we really wondered, okay, well, how do we take fan, you know, fantastic chatbots and infobots that are already out there, these FAQ bots, and how do we uh, augment them or, or sort of support them to also have symptom tracking and surveys that can be run on, on those chatbots as well. So not only are people then able to ask questions and get answers the way that Karen showed, fan, like fantastic, and that's, that's uh, really useful, um, but also how can we enable either end beneficiaries to track their own COVID symptoms or um, let's say they, let's say a frontline worker does want to um, initiate that workflow so that an end beneficiary can be tracked once they have visited a hospital um, and they are tracked uh, for 14 days after, you know, during quarantine, how can all of that happen over both WhatsApp, SMS, and maybe even USSD? So, you know, really trying to build around, especially when it comes to low and middle income countries, um, where WhatsApp penetration is probably on average between, you know, five and 10%, um, how do we still ensure that we can build a solution that has these fallbacks to, um, solutions that are uh, more widely available, such as SMS and USSD. Um, so I actually will, will maybe share my screen as well um, and just kind of quickly show you guys a, a few slides. Um, and they really do build uh, exactly on top of um, what uh, Karen was showing earlier. Uh, but as you can see here on the left, this is exactly what she showed with the WHO bot. And we just kind of worked with part in partnership with uh, Prekelt um, to kind of uh, augment and support on top of their, their standard government-wide uh, info bot to add on Community Pulse. And so Community Pulse is a assessment tool um, that allows people to either self-track their symptoms or for frontline workers to uh, track uh, community members' symptoms as well. Um, and I can just show you quickly, I'll just skip through that, uh, but this is a little bit about how um, the system works. Um, so there is an infobot portion to it, and then on the right, as you can see, there's a symptom tracker. Uh, it's very simple. It doesn't have the complexity of natural language understanding or processing at the moment. Uh, we just wanted to take what's possible in ComCare and make it kind of unveil it to uh, messaging solutions. Uh, here it's shown as WhatsApp, but it can also be done um, over SMS and, and then we're looking at USSD as well. Um, so that's sort of one way and uh, how Damagi has sort of been looking at, um, you know, supporting COVID use cases. Um, we've also been looking at situations in the U.S. actually. So there are a few states in the U.S. that have adopted ComCare as their method for doing contact tracing. Um, and, and that's really been an interesting uh, development since, since the Magi does not typically focus on American or more developed nations kind of use cases were really low and middle income focused. Um, and so, you know, it's an offline first solution and in the US it's primarily online first. And so it does change um, our uh, method and processes for how, how we process data and how we deliver that data back to the servers as well as back to the users. Um, but yeah. I'll stop there. I think those are some some ways in which we've augmented the solution to support uh, both in Ebola as well as now in COVID um, with uh, with our solution. Great. Thanks so much, Shabnam. Um, <clears throat> really useful to be thinking about how best we can reach everyone and um, thinking about how the technology needs to be fit for the use environment and how you all are thinking about leveraging SMS and USSD to make sure that at least everywhere where there is digital connectivity uh, or where there are digital devices, you're able to reach people as best as possible. Um, so I'd love to come back to you in just a minute uh, to talk a little bit more about some of these concepts. Um, but in the meantime, I see there are a number of questions that are already coming through in the chat window. Um, and so let me start to turn to those. Um, 
Koku, we had talked um, earlier about, you know, thinking about all of these different pieces together. Um, we know that there are a lot of digital systems um, that are available today. Um, some of them have duplicative functionality. And so from your perspective with the Ghana Health Service, how have you all prioritized which tools um, you are using? And um, if you have a message for others who are joining the webinar or listening in um, about how best, for example, um, partners, including donors and, and multilateral lateral institutions can be supporting Ghana um, in its use of these tools, uh, what would you ask us to be thinking about um, as we respond to COVID-19? Oh, and it looks like you're still on mute, Coco. I did the same thing. <laughs> Th thank you very much, Adley. I think you made a very, very important point that the, the market is flooded with a lot of uh, e-health solutions. And I can tell you that even with the onset of COVID, uh, the number of uh, people who are coming and proposing, you know, various uh, e-health uh, solutions, uh, you know, apps, etc. But I think the focus should always be that we should always try to see what we have first and try to build on that. One of the, and I mean, there's nothing wrong bringing in new technology to supplement what is already in the field. But I think that in, 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 in trying to look at other solutions, one of the most important thing is to start thinking about how, you know, the whole idea about interoperability, uh, because you can have a system that you spend so much on, and at the end of the day, you have it not really syncing with what is already existing. So I think the whole issue of, you know, um, interoperability is very, very important so that we can address those challenges that you don't have a solution that after a couple of months and six, six, of six months, eight months, one year, they cannot talk to each other and you cannot integrate the data. Data integration is very important so that you do not have data which is scattered all over the place that you have to, 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 to start. Uh, so I think that is, that is, the other thing is also, you know, the cost. We, we need to be mindful of the cost of technology and uh, how you are able to sustain it and make sure that you keep it running. And so for us in Ghana, even though we have the SOMAX as the tool that we are now using to collect um, COVID data, the idea is that we'll get it integrated into the DIS2 too. So that because with the DIS2, DHSI2 and the e-tracker, you know, it's, import, it's possible that we can do that integration and uh, have one-stop shop solution in terms of e-health systems. Great. Yeah, thank you. I think those are all fantastic points. And um, listening to you talk about seeing what we have first and building on that um, reminds me to mention for those who are not yet aware, this is something that the global community of digital health practitioners has been thinking a lot about how do we best um, assess what is already being used so we know what to build off of uh, in the future. And there is a relatively new tool that the WHO has produced called the Digital Health Atlas, which is uh, an effort to canvas and capture at the country level all of the existing digital health exactly. solutions. Um, and that kind of level of situational awareness is, is really important at the country level, but also for partners of countries to be well informed about the landscape. Um, there's also the Global Digital Health Index, which is uh, a, also a relatively new tool that categorizes the use environment for digital technologies so that we are more informed at a more granular level about where are the relative strengths and weaknesses um, across the country so that we are positioning corollary investments in digital technologies in a strategic and effective way. Um, and I think that also speaks to the interoperability needs and the needs to be thinking about funding a full suite of um, activities that accompany the digital technologies to ensure that we have a strong uh, use environment. So let me move and, on. And Adley, Adley yeah. and making sure that, you know, we, we have to avoid duplication of tools. I think that's very important. Duplication of tools is one of the challenges that we also face. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That is a great point. Uh, so let me turn to some of the other questions that have come in. Karin, we have one here for you. Um, the question is, among all the platforms and uses that you mentioned, do you have any evidence that they are A, being used as intended, and B, the degree to which they're assisting with containing or facilitating 
the Ministry of Health's response to the epidemic. So um, a question about you know, evidence um, as intended and, and how they are strengthening um, country health systems. Thanks, yeah, that's a very good question, a very important question we should always ask. Um, when it comes to targeted me like messaging and, and two-way communication using digital messaging, that is actually one of the interventions that is recommended based from the WHO, um, from this thorough review that was done on digital health interventions. And it was after a, a lengthy process of doing systematic reviews of the evidence behind these types of interventions. So there has been uh, numerous studies showing that digital health messaging is in fact a very effective intervention. Now, the way we have applied it in the chat box is it really depends a bit on the use case as well, whether we can say it's sort of is being used as intended. Like a large need that happened during the COVID was just having information available that was vetted as sort of the single truth, you know, like the, 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 there was a lot of misinformation being spread. So these chatbots, what we could see was very quickly became that source that people turn to, to seek information that was, uh, you know, WHO or UNICEF vetted. Um, we can track this by just looking at the number of interactions with users and how user numbers went up uh, and is still going up. As soon as we add more uh, content, we see users sort of subscribing to these channels. And I think that can sort of show that they are used as intended. They were meant to be an information platform where people can seek out information. Now, the question is to chatbots more generally, are they effective in, in changing behavior? We did a, a very quick literature review on this as well, um, very early on to see um, if there is evidence that chatbots is very effective for that purpose. And there is actually a number of studies done, both randomized control trials, mo mainly in developed contexts on smoking cessation, cessation and other um, life skills development, et cetera. And there is kind of, um, there's kind of a good evidence base now showing that these chatbots, as long as they are engaging as long as the content is relevant and as long as there is options for users to sort of type and have a natural conversation with a chatbot that people do use them and they do have um, they can have an impact on improving behavior when it comes then to the third use case around training um, this is a an important area which we're also looking into doing uh, desk reviews at the moment and we have found some evidence from amref for example have done um, they have a a very similar chatbot for delivering of <clears throat> refresher training to community health workers who are in remote areas. And they actually found that delivering sort of the, the normal package of uh, content that health workers need to know at the, at the frontline community health workers in Kenya, it, that kind of uh, refresher training was equally effective as face-to-face -face, uh, training. And knowing how much it costs to do face-to-face -face training, um, there is uh, some sort of, um, reason to believe that having, having this offline, uh, sorry, online and being able to deliver this online to those who are in the most remote communities can be a very effective way of, of uh, supporting those community health workers who would otherwise not be able to come to face-to-face -to -face trainings. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Karen. Um, I want to build off this conversation, Shabnam, and bring you in um, and ask a related follow-on question, which uh, has come in from one of the um, audience members about um, evaluations that are specifically about um, the economic cost effectiveness of digital tools um, and ask if this is something that you all have looked at as Demandri with the work that you've done. Um, and there's a second question for you, if asking if you could talk a little bit more about uh, how Comcare is being used for contact tracing in particular, um, and what is the value of using digital for contact tracing? Uh, what makes a digital tool well primed to be able to do contact tracing well? So two part question for you there about um, evidence and specifically cost effectiveness and then any insights you wanna share based on um, the contact tracing work you all have done now across multiple disease outbreaks in multiple parts of the world about what really makes it most effective. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adele. Um, so I think on the evidence and um, cost effectiveness side of the, the question, um, there is definitely a lot of evidence we've got just from the 15 years of running ComCare and doing various um, randomized controlled trials and evidence-based uh, research um, around 
using ComCare for data collection um, or generally data collection tools as compared to paper-based data collection. Um, and, and there is um, quite a bit of evidence base. You, guys, uh, you can feel free to go to themagi.com and there are all of our case studies and evidence base listed there um, on our website. Um, I actually don't have like the hard numbers for you today, unfortunately, but um, I'm happy to uh, come back with those numbers at another webinar if we do another one um, at, at another time. On the contact tracing side of things, um, so I, I think the word and the phrase contact tracing has a few different meanings at this stage. So it's important to kind of note that the way that ComCare can support contact tracing is very much um, in the manual process. So not sort of any kind of Bluetooth technology that would be you know, following you and all the people that you're seeing um, or kind of tracing and tracking where you're moving and who you're in contact with. Um, that, is, that is something we very intentionally have stayed away from. Um, we are pretty much focused on using ComCare as a data collection tool for contact tracing. So really in the US, for example, um, people are using ComCare to um, see a list of contacts uh, or, or users, uh, beneficiaries, who are, however you want to call them, um, with their phone numbers. And then they call that person, have a conversation with them, um, try and find out if they've been in contact with anyone who has had COVID and who else have they been in con contact with. And then they kind of build on that list accordingly um, and try and educate people um, and make them aware of um, how to be more careful around COVID um, and, and COVID problems. So um, a little bit different from perhaps some of the other countries uh, that are doing a little bit more of a digitized contact tracing solution, um, but uh, you know, still enabling the digital tracking um, or, or sorry, digital data collection piece of it um, on ComCare. And we have some web apps as well as a, um, sorry, as well as a Android app. So you can use uh, ComCare both on like your computer as well as an iPhone, as well as an Android phone. And then uh, of course, also on WhatsApp and SMS as well now. I'm not sure if that answered the whole question though, Adele. No, that, that's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, and I know you all have a robust evidence base good to let people know where they can go to learn more. Um, and you know, this question of, of cost effectiveness is an important one. Um, and Koku also mentioned we need to be mindful of costs uh, so that we're thinking about how we can be using these tools in a way that meets the immediate need, but it's also sustainable over the long term. Uh, and I think that's an area that increasingly um, multilateral partners, bilateral donors, uh, other funders are, are thinking about with governments in terms of how can we take um, a, a, an approach that historically um, across different groups has really been driven by specific um, disease um, prevention and response use cases or specific um, health service delivery and wellness, wellness promotion areas and move that into um, a, a more sustainable um, and more cohesive um, country-based approach where we have increasingly countries that are building national digital health strategies um, or the like, um, oftentimes uh, and increasingly accompanied by cost and implementation roadmaps. And that can be a really powerful way to ensure that the countries are um, identifying the tools they see best meet their needs given the use environment and are providing some guidance to a range of partners about how best to support those tools in a sustainable way going forward. Um, and one thing that we've done at USAID is think about how we can be leveraging our funding from across different health verticals, um, not only to better coordinate and align our funding internally, but to create a vehicle to do so in collaboration with the broader community, knowing that this is a need um, across the, the funder landscape. Uh, and we have a tool that we've created. Um, it's a USAID funding mechanism called Digital Square that enables us to align investments internally and align them and match them um, with un other funders. And we think that kind of a co-investment approach um, is really important for thinking about how we can bear these costs in a sustainable way going forward. Um, so I think we have time maybe for one or two last questions. Um, I have a question here that I will just open to anyone who wants to take a stab at it. And um, as we think about the new solutions that have been developed for COVID-19, um, including the ones we've discussed here today that are adaptations on the edges of existing mature digital health technologies, uh, we've talked a lot about what's working and what we're building on. Um, but we have a question about um, where there are areas where there is still clear need. If from your perspective, um, perhaps Coco for you as well, um, 
there are clear areas where we do need new tools, where we do need to be thinking about new innovations, um, or if it really is across the board, uh, important to be thinking about how we balance existing tools with, um, with innovation need areas. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, yeah, there are definitely will be uh, areas that will need new tools uh, uh, to be able to address some of the challenges that we face in, in not even, not necessarily COVID, but even post-COVID and new epidemics and pandemics and all that. Um, I think that the, for, for us, what we have found useful is the use of e-tracker where at the community level, which is the primary healthcare level, you know, um, frontline health workers are able to collect the necessary data and transmit those data along the, the strand of, you know, district level, regional level, national level data. So we, we get uh, transactional data to make decisions at, at the, you know, at the goal. Um, maybe, um, the whole idea about use of GIS for mapping and therefore trying to understand, you know, clusters of uh, cases and try to quickly address, you know, for interventions, uh, I think will be one of the areas. And, and again, GIS technology is already available. So what we need to be doing probably is to how we incorporate that within our, you know, e-health e solutions in terms of the data that we are collecting from the point of care. I think that will be one of the areas that I will immediately think about, even though there might be other areas, you know, to, to, to talk about yeah, or to think about. Yeah, GIS is an important one um, with lots of applications across um, different digital health interventions um, that can really empower them. Um, we're getting close to the end of the hour. And so I'll ask one last question and ask each of you to give a, a brief response, um, which is around how we are um, taking lessons that we've learned from past experiences and incorporating them here. Um, the questioner asked specifically, Shabnam, um, your expertise says that you focus on failures. I think it's really important to be transparent about what we can learn and normalize failures. Uh, can each of the panelists talk about failures or insights um, from past experiences with the tools that they have used and what they would do differently moving forward um, and moving forward specifically in the context of COVID-19? So Shabnam, over to you first. Thanks for that question. Um, I appreciate the, the vote of confidence on, on embracing failure. Um, I would say that the biggest learning, I, I actually, as a, was perhaps stated in my introduction, I was an entrepreneur um, in India for a long time. And I think one of the biggest um, learnings I had that is very applicable to not only COVID, but um, the work that we do now with the Magi um, is, is trying to kind of force an end user to use a solution rather than building the solution around their existing day-to-day -day activities. And a good example of that in this case, I think is when we started looking at WhatsApp as well as an option, um, and we got very excited about it because of the opportunity to do rich media, the opportunity to use natural language processing. There's so many cool things you can do with WhatsApp. The reality of the situation was that um, not that many people, especially at the low and middle income demographic, are have access to WhatsApp or have access to data. Um, and so then we started realizing that there had to be, um, rather than kind of forcing people or asking them to get onto a channel or a, um, a solution that they're not already aware of, which is what I had done kind of in the past, um, was really trying to build around uh, people's existing um, channels of communication and and comfort as well as their access. Uh, so I think that's a really important one um, from a learning's perspective. Uh, the second, of course, is that, um, you know, designing these workflows and, and these solutions for um, what people, how people would prefer to communicate and how they, how they, um, how much like back and forth they can really handle uh, because I am a user as well and I've been sort of asked to communicate with chatbots or with IVR in the past and it can often lead to a frustrating user experience when you just really want to talk to a human being. So creating those fallbacks to human beings um, so that there is that access to a real person if, if there is either an emergency or just a need to speak to a human. 
Yeah. Um, we started looking and I'm gonna, at- Sorry, uh, sorry to cut you off. I'm gonna turn it over to Karin and then to Coco because we sorry. have just a couple minutes left, but design with the user, a really important one. Uh, I think it's the very first of the principles for digital development um, and that's a great one. Uh, Karin, from your perspective, are there key insights that you would like people to be thinking about as we move forward with leveraging existing technologies for the COVID-19 response? I think the, the main thing I'd like to mention is let's think about solutions that can work beyond the COVID response. If, if possible, think about sort of what is the use case in a year's time when maybe the immediate emergency phase is, is over and we need to um, potentially revise the content, revise the, the sort of the data coming in from these systems. Think about um, how we don't just set up systems that are free of offered to us free of charge for the next six months without thinking about what's the business case beyond that who's going to pay for it um, so for a lot of the work that we do in, in unicef we're trying to think about if it can support the immediate response right now how can it also support the health system strengthening efforts in the longer term how can it build a more resilient health system um, I think we had a, a major failure after the Ebola response was that we didn't learn, and we didn't use the learnings. Um, you mentioned it in the beginning, Adele, the fact that we, we knew from um, one of the very success, successful stories was that we used health worker registries so that we could um, communicate to health workers and start collecting data and instructing health workers what to do. The fact that most, many, many countries out there today still don't have community or health worker registries. Countries don't know who is in their workforce, but they don't know what their phone numbers are. Um, there's no sort of master facility list to classify, to sort of keep track of all the health facilities and, and which ones are operational and which ones have staff and where they are located geographically. I think had we learned from the Ebola response, we would have had investments in those core functions of a health system mm -hmm. so that we could quickly have added on some of these technology solutions to start sort of um, sending information and collecting the information we need. Now we're still struggling to actually build that core functionality even during the immediate pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, being sustainable, thinking about long-term system strengthening in addition to responding to immediate needs um, and, and incorporating those lessons, which we, we do see happening uh, in a number of countries. I think we're, we're seeing um, progress from where we were at the outset of the Ebola outbreak, uh, for example, in Liberia um, and, and other countries that were affected there, um, where these systems are integrating some of these tools like Adhero, which is now part of Liberia's COVID-19 formal response strategy. Um, so continuing to operationalize those insights. Coco, we've got just a minute left, so just a really quick word or two. Sorry to give you less time, um, but would love to hand it over to you for the final word, and then we'll turn it over to Megan to help close us out. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Adley. Um, I think that I, I just want to reiterate the fact that um, I mean, major challenges in the health sector, including COVID-19, uh, definitely can be better addressed through the use of, uh, uh, you know, strategic use of ICT. It's, there's no doubt about that. And it's very important that we use this technology, you know, to leverage, basically leverage, you know, as, as an enabler of, 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 of getting access to services and broader health systems, et cetera. Um, in my view, um, I think that's the way that we need to go. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that digital technology can help to meet, you know, the objectives of, of, of health services, whether it's quality of care, whether it's access, et cetera. And I think that that is what we need to do, particularly at this time when we have COVID-19, uh, take advantage of these solutions and try to use them for the benefit of, uh, you know, addressing these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Koku. Um, and thanks again to the organizers for the session. Um, on behalf of USAID and uh, the Center for Innovation and Impact in the Global Health Bureau, um, it's been wonderful to be part of this conversation. Megan, I will turn it over to you to help close out. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much, Adele. That concludes our fourth Data Science and AI Summits for Healthcare webinar. Uh, many thanks to our panelists, Adele, Shabnam, Koku, Karin, for this incredibly informative conversation today. It's really fantastic to hear about the breadth of tools that are being used in the COVID response and to think about how they can be used for both other diseases uh, and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us and submitting those thought-provoking questions that really guided the conversation today. Um, we hope to see you on our next webinar, which is taking place on June 16th, where we're going to discuss the role of image-based AI in the COVID-19 response. Uh, with that, have a wonderful afternoon or evening, wherever you are, and be sure to take care of yourselves and others. Thanks so much. <laughs>